encourage your soul, enlighten your mind, and empower your faith. This is The Light Network. Contemplating the practical message of Jesus for our lives. Welcome to Today with Jesus. My name is Robert Hatfield. My name is Dan Winkler, and we are involved in a study of the book Colossians. And I hope that you have enjoyed studying with this with us through this book as much as Robert and I have enjoyed studying. In fact, we've kind of put a moniker over the whole series for this uh, year, changed by the book of Colossians. And we're trying to make this ever so practical. Robert, thank you for helping us do that. We're coming to Colossians 2, verse 11 uh, through verse 15 Mm -hmm. today. Why don't you read that for us? And then we're going to focus on this idea of how blessed we are with baptism. Could I start looking by looking at two or three verses before we read? Of course. Okay. Matthew 28, of course, is the Matthew's account of what we like to call the Great Commission. And he said to his apostles, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go you therefore and literally make disciples. And then he uses two modal participles telling them, telling us how to make disciples. Go make disciples. Modal participle number one, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Modal participle number two, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. So according to Jesus, to become one of his true followers, part of that involves being baptized. Mark's account says this in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieves shall be condemned. The word believe there carries the idea of accepting what God says, trusting in what God says, and acting on what God says. So that being the case, watch what Jesus said. He that accepts, trusts, and acts on what God says, believes, and is baptized as a result, shall be saved. He that does not accept, trust, and act on what God says, believes, shall be condemned. Point is, when we accept what God says, trust in what God says, and act on what God says to the point we are baptized the way God says, salvation comes into our lives. When we fail to do so, we stay in a state of condemnation. So both Matthew and Mark's account of what we call the Great Commission shows the importance of our being baptized. So we come to Colossians 3 today and look at verses 11 to 15, and we're impressed by three beautiful word pictures by which the Holy Spirit presents the importance of baptism to our lives. Why don't we read that, uh, Robert, and then we'll dive into each of those word pictures. Sure. Colossians 2.11, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Robert, I'm impressed with the fact that those beautiful words are prefaced by what we find, <clears throat> excuse me, in verses 9 and 10. Mm-hmm. In verse 9, in him, of course, references to Jesus. 
in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity that God had dwells bodily. In other words, everything that God has offered to mankind is wrapped up and recognized in Jesus. And maybe that's why Jesus so frequently in the book of John made those I am statements. I am the light of the world. I am uh, the resurrection and the life. Uh, I am uh, the vine. And, and on and on we could go where Jesus presents himself as the way, the truth, the life, the one through whom we have access to everything that God offers us. So in Jesus dwells all the fullness of of the Godhead. But then verse 10 says, and you have been filled in him. Not only do we see everything the Godhead offering man wrapped up and recognized in Jesus, when we have a relationship with Jesus, we are literally filled up with all of those wonderful blessings. And those two thoughts pave the way to what you just read a few minutes ago about baptism. I think we're reading about baptism as we look at verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism. Right here in the heart of the reading, we're reading about baptism, and it's presented to us in three beautiful word pictures. I like word pictures, and I know you do too, Robert. A picture's worth a thousand words, but word pictures are even more powerful. So, <laughs> You tell me what three word pictures do you see in our reading for baptism? Mm. Well, we see the idea of circumcision several yes. times in this yes. text, verses 11 and 13 especially. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, there's this word picture of a death. Or, uh, a death is implied in verse 12, but the burial is mentioned there and then the resurrection the death is mentioned in verse uh, 13, that we were dead in our trespasses, and thus we have died with Christ and been uh, buried and raised. And then there's a cancellation of debt in verses 14 and 15, and uh, a triumph over that. Okay, three beautiful word pictures. Let's look at each of them individually and see what the Holy Spirit is telling us in reference to how we are so blessed with and when we're baptized. Let's look first of all at this concept of circumcision. What comes to your mind uh, biblically when I say circumcision, Robert? Uh, go back to the Old Testament and uh, God telling Abraham, hey, listen, this is what you're supposed to do. And of course, that became the sign of in young Jewish males uh, that they were a part of that covenant with God. That's right. Yeah. I find that in Genesis chapter 17. And of interest to me as I'm reading Genesis 17, and I would encourage all of us to do this, um, I went through there and I actually circled the word covenant as I was reading it throughout that chapter. This, by the way, is the chapter where I, I began reading it and Abraham is 99 years old. Mm -hmm. And this is when God comes to Abraham and he says, okay, uh, you've been Abram now <laughs> for almost a hundred years, and I'm going to change the name. And he changes his name from Abram to Abraham, meaning father of multitudes. And of course, he and Sarah had had no biological child as of yet. And also in this same chapter is when God changed the name of his wife from Sarai to Sarah, meaning princess, because she was going to be the mother of a multitude of nations, though she had not had a biological child as of yet. So here, here he is 99 years old, and he and his wife's names are changed, and God promises in one year you're going to have a biological child. And it's in this entire context where God starts talking about the covenant that he was going to make between himself, God, and uh, Abraham and Sarah and their progeny. And he uses the word covenant in Genesis 17 
no less than 13 times. And he actually qualifies it in a special way. He says, my covenant, nine of those 13 times. Mm. And so God is saying to Abraham, I'm going to make an arrangement with you and with all of those that come from this little baby that is to be born in a year. And it's going to be my arrangement with you and your progeny of interest in that chapter. 10 times he uses the word circumcise in some form. And in Genesis 17, verse 13, we read this, both he who is born in your house and he who is brought, bought with money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not uncircumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And so circumcision was the sign of this special arrangement that God made with Abraham and all of his descendants. Of course, we know them to be the Jewish people, the Israelites. And so here is this special sign of a special arrangement. Now, I want you, Robert, to kind of bridge the gap of thought. In what way would What does the Holy Spirit have in mind here presenting to us baptism as somewhat of a spiritual circumstance? With that background in mind, what can we make of this word picture? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, And I think there's several clues in the text. Uh, You were circumcised, he says. And I think it's important to note that throughout this, Paul writing to the church in Colossae, is writing to people who have already done these things. He's reminding them, you were circumcised, having been buried, verse 12. You were dead in your trespasses, and God has made you alive together with him, verse 13. So we'll, we'll see all of this as we go through. You were circumcised, he says, with a circumcision made without hands. All right, now we're, we're, we're hearkening back to those Old Testament images But instead of talking about something that is done physically to the physical body, he's now talking about something that is made without hands, a a phrase that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, to talk about when our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, an idea that uh, will be used in Mark 14, verse 58 as well. We heard him say, referring to Jesus, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. And as we talked about in our study of Mark, that being a reference to Jesus' resurrection. Yes. And so when we're talking about when Paul, the Holy Spirit through Paul, talks about a circumcision made without hands, circumcision gives us this idea, this notion of the removal of something, Mm -hmm. even in a sense cutting away of something, And then made without hands tells us we're talking about something of a spiritual nature. Paul continues, I'm spiritually circumcised by putting off the body of flesh, uh, putting off removal, the stripping of this body of flesh. And Paul will often speak of the body consisting of the flesh as sort of the medium in which sin works. Uh, the, the place where sin is. Romans chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. Wretched man that I am, Paul says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Uh, Good point. A reference there just to, to, to his flesh. Mm-hmm. Later in Colossians chapter 3, if we drop down to verse 9, Paul will say, don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And he'll go on to say in verse 10, you've put on the new self. And to me, that helps to really get to the bottom of what Paul is discussing here in our text. We were circumcised. Here's a spiritual circumcision, a putting off, a, I think we could say, a purging of sin. And this is Christ's circumcision. Mm -hmm. This is something that belongs to him. It's the circumcision of Christ. 
he says at the end of that verse. And uh, down in verse 13, he'll tell us how and when all of that took place. You who were dead in your trespasses and the, look at that, uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses. See, that confirms what we have said up in verse 11. The opposite of being circumcised would be uncircumcision. He says it's a circumcision made without hands by putting off the flesh. Down in verse 13, he says, when you were dead in your sins or trespasses, that's the same as being uncircumcised in your flesh. And if we link that back to verse 12 in baptism, our sins are purged, thereby accomplishing what Paul in this text uh, refers to as the circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of the flesh. So here I am living a life of sin, uh, a sinner, and then I become somebody different. Mm. And the old man and the old ways and all of the guilt that came from living those ways are all put away. They're all put off. Mm. They're circumcised from me as a person, and now I'm someone brand spanking new. Talk to me about this covenant concept. This is intriguing to me. Yeah, Uh, that's interesting, isn't it? So in as much as Genesis 17 emphasized that the circumcision was a sign of the covenant, here's a, a, a promise that God is making, and that by entering into your end of this covenant, You're saying, I'm going to live up to my end of what it is, God, that you are telling us to do. God says, you enter into this covenant with me, and I will do the following. God had given specific promises to Abraham, uh, some of those uh, a little more specific to his time, uh, but ultimately even fulfilled in Christ. Uh, Galatians chapter 3 says that if we're Christ's, then we are Abraham's seed, Spiritually speaking, Spiritually yes. speaking, yes. and heirs according to the promise. Uh-huh. You know, God had promised Abraham land. Uh, God had pr- certainly promised Abraham a, a wide, uh, uh, a, a, a vast number of descendants. Important, of course, because at his old age, he didn't have any at the time that that uh, pronouncement was made. Mm-hmm. God enters into this covenant. God does so, and it's signified, at least from the human perspective, in circumcision. And uh, there have to be parallels as we think about here in Colossians chapter two, that we would have our flesh, that is our sin put off from us. And in so doing, we've signified that we're in a, we could say covenant relationship with God through Christ. Um, I am bound to him. And uh, that's a wonderful thing, knowing that he's going to enter into that covenant with me as well keeping promises to me as I keep promises to him. And uh, we're in a relationship together in that way. Yes. So I find it of, of interest that when we go back to the Old Testament, God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, mm-hmm. that through his seed shall all the family of the earth be blessed. And Abraham was only 75 years old when that promise was made. And now here he is, 99, and the promise was going to be actually fulfilled one year later when he was 100 years old. So for 25 years, Abraham has had that promise, and now the promise becomes a reality. But but Robert, the arrangement didn't exist for those 25 years. Mm. God made a promise, and then the arrangement Uh, This special covenant did not come to be until he's 99 years old, and this circumcision is introduced by God in Genesis 17. And then when the circumcision transpires and the little boy is born, now there's a whole group of people that has this special relationship with God that never existed before. And this concept is brought into the book of Colossians to help us see what baptism means to us. In fact, look at how verse 12 begins. Let's look at verses 11 and 12 of Colossians 2 together. 
in him, Jesus, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In other words, symbolically speaking, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. And then watch how verse 12 begins. Having been buried with him in baptism. Verse 12 explains the symbolic circumcision referenced in verse 11. It's when we're baptized that this symbolic circumcision transpires. And so we are brought into a special arrangement with God. We are brought into a special relationship with God. We began to have a, a, a special covenant relationship with God when we go through this spiritual circumcision that takes place at baptism. So the old man that used to be the sinner is cut away. All of the sins and all of the guilt of those sins are purged, put away, cut away. And here we are, a new person in a covenant, beautiful relationship with God. That's what happens. That's what happens when we're baptized. That makes baptism very special. And it helps us to see how blessed we are when we're baptized. What do you think, Robert? I love it. How could you not? <laughs> I know. There's a second word picture presented to us in verses 12 and 13. Uh, kind of pick up there and walk away with it. <laughs> We've been buried with him and we were raised with him. The hymn here is a reference to Jesus, as we've already seen. You pointed out, going back up, even to verse 9, in him, Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And so here's this idea of being very intimately associated with Jesus, even uniting in his burial. Now, uh, you bury one who has passed, one who is dead. And so mm -hmm. that death is implied. We saw that in the circumcision there. Uh, as you linked verses 11 and 12 together, cutting away and purging that old flesh. And so when we are in baptism, we're buried with Jesus and raised with Jesus. And I love that all of this is according to or through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Mm. Paul makes an, an interesting uh, parallel to this in Ephesians chapter 1 when he Paul says, I'm praying that you'll come to know the power that is available for you in Jesus. And then he illustrates it in this beautiful Christological passage. He talks about how the power of God worked in Jesus to raise him from the dead and exalt him high above and, and seat him in his own right hand, um, uh, where he's made him the head over all things uh, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. But the grand the, the point that Paul is making in context there in Ephesians 1, 19 and following is, I want you to know that that power that has accomplished that in Jesus is available in you as a Christian. And I think that's the, the similar point here. Look, you've been buried with him and you've been raised with him. And all of that takes place based on your faith, your confidence in, your trust in, your acting on the powerful working of God who by whose power Jesus himself now lives and you can be united with him by that same power. That tells me several things. Uh, first of all, that the benefits of baptism can only come by the power of God. Yes. So it's, this isn't, I can't go and secure these blessings on my own doing, by my own merit, uh, and I can't save myself. I think that's what we're essentially talking about. But at the same time, that that makes it to where I must do it the way that God has told me to do it if I'm going to access those blessings. And so it begins by being buried with him, at least as Paul puts it here in verse 12. This sharing in Christ's death and his burial. Uh, 
the passage you have to go to with this, I think, is Romans chapter six. Oh yeah. In fact, Paul, I've already turned there. Okay, well, good. Well, then you pick it up from there. While oh I no, pull it up I didn't so mean to do that. <laughs> well, well, I guess I was thinking while you were uh, helping us there. Uh, for where does forgiveness actually take place? Mm. Mm-hmm. Forgiveness takes place in the mind and heart of God. God, yeah. And so w- it, it's not okay, I'm being baptized and now look what I did. Yeah. But rather I'm being immersed, which is the meaning of the word baptized. I'm being immersed. And now look what's being done to me. Mm -hmm. God is seeing me. He's willing to see me in a different light. He's willing to see me as someone that is forgiven. If we go to Romans six, beginning with verse one, uh, there are there are three little uh, tidbits that I have written in the margin of my Bible there. And I would like to suggest that we all, uh, I know that some of us are, are, are driving at the time, but maybe mm-hmm. if we can remember when we get to our desk, get to work, or when we get home, if we could jot these down in the margin of Romans 6 or maybe in our notes if we like to journal. Uh, there are three things that are said about sin and the Christian and baptism. Uh, let's look at all three of them. Let's start with Romans 6, verse 1 through verse 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin, literally remain over sin, that grace may abound? And then this very emphatic answer from the Holy Spirit through Paul, by no means. God forbid, as some translations say, Uh, my mentor and dear friend, uh, William Woodson, used to say, may the mother of the mother of the thought not ever be allowed. (laughs) Uh, Very, very emphatic. So can we continue to uh, to remain over or in sin just because we become Christians? Don't you even dare think that way. And then he makes this statement. How can we who died to sin still live in it? We died to sin. That takes place, by the way, when we make a decision relative to sin. We make the decision to change the way we think about it and change the way we live in reference to it. And that's repentance. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, that's what we're talking about today, baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death, literally in order to obtain the benefits of his death. We were buried, therefore, with him, buried by baptism in order to obtain this spiritual death. That uh, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, here are two words to write in the margin of Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. Died to. We have died to sin, the old sin, the old ways of life. We've died to that. We can't any longer live that way. And that happened when we were baptized and went through this symbolic death, burial, resurrection as Jesus was, as Jesus died and was buried and was raised by God. Even so, we, we, we die to sin uh, when we repent. We are buried immer- when we're immersed in water. We come up out of that water with the determination to be somebody brand spanking new and walk in newness of life. So a spiritual, symbolic death, burial, resurrection allows us uh, to say, I have died to sin. And that happens at baptism. Now we come to Romans 6, verses 5 through 11. And the way to summarize these words are by the two words, delivered from. We've been delivered from sin with all of our past sins, with all of the guilt. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. 
We know that our old self was crucified with him. There's this death in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We've been delivered from the sin, the man of sin that we used to be. We've been delivered from sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. When did that spiritual death take place? When we repented? When did that new man come to be? When we were immersed and brought up from the waters of baptism to walk in newness of life. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We're to live with Jesus in this new identity and try to be like Jesus. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we're, we've died to sin. We've been, been delivered from all of the guilt of our past. We're dead to all of that. And then we come to verse 12, and we could summarize verse 12 with two words, disobedient to. This is one of those rare passages in the Bible where God tells us to disobey. Disobey what? Be disobedient to sin's demands. Mm. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Disobey the edicts of sin, the demands of sin. So we, we've died, we've gone through a spiritual death, burial, resurrection, and have become someone brand new with the purpose of walking in newness of life. We've died to sin. We've been delivered from all of the guilt of sin, and we are disobedient to the cravings of sin. And all of this that line of demarcation, as it's called, this line in the sand that's drawn between the person that used to be and this brand new person that now is with new purpose and new direction of life, all of that takes place at one point in time. When we go through this spiritual burial and resurrection, when we're baptized. And so Colossians 2 presents baptism to us as a resurrection. It is a circumcision. It is a resurrection in word picture. There's a third one. And I'd like to introduce that and throw it back to you. Talk about this third one, Robert. Mm -hmm. Death, or rather baptism, is presented to us also in Colossians 2, 11 to 15 as a cancellation. A cancellation of what? Help me with that. Mm. He says, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Uh, you know, a lot of people today want to dismiss uh, sin altogether, and especially in so doing the consequences of it. Uh, I believe what Paul's talking about here is a record of debt. That is to say, what we have gotten ourselves into by <laughs> our sins. Yes. You know, sin comes with a price tag. If we go back up to verse 13 a second, Paul says that before those wonderful blessings that we've just described from verse 12. Prior to that, our status was dead in your trespasses. <clears throat> now, it can be said that those of us who have submitted to the gospel of Christ in baptism, contacted the blood of Jesus, and therefore appropriated all of those available blessings to our souls, are made alive together with him, and God has forgiven us all our trespasses, the end of verse 13. But the consequences of sin, well, it's death. And the wages, to quote Paul in Romans chapter 6, the wages of sin is death, verse 23. Uh -huh. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nevertheless, there are these wages. There is something that those who have not been cleared, forgiven of, whose debt has not been canceled, well, then we're going to be responsible for that. 
Sometimes we sing in, in a song, G- he, Jesus, paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. Of interest, the Bible teaches in uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, John is permitted to see the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And in that text, he says, the books were open. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. According to what I've read with regard to the word studies here used in Colossians 2.14, this record of debt does give this, this connotation of something that has been written, a ledger, so to speak, of deeds that have been done. And in the context, this is something that stood against us and that by the law demanded, I think the implication is, punitive action be taken against yes. those uh, on about whom this record is kept. But the beautiful thing about this verse is, and we got to remember this verse is an isolated is not isolated from everything that we've just been studying because it begins right in the middle of a sentence. But in this sweep of forgiveness, verse 13, our the record of debt that stood against us was canceled, translating a term that means to wipe away or to erase. And Paul elaborates in verse 14 by telling us he set this record of debt that stood against us aside, nailing it to the cross, linking, of course, in the cross, uh, this death, burial, resurrection that we've been studying in verse 12, this idea of covenant that we were studying back up in verse 11 with connection to circumcision, and all of this wrapped around or ultimately finding uh, implementation, I'm struggling with the word, in baptism. There it is. That's where all of this is done for me. Uh, And so anyway, rambling of thoughts there, but uh, there's a lot wrapped up there in verse 14, canceling the record of debt. I, I see the word forgiven in verse 13. And then I see there toward the end of verse 14, he set aside. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just can't wrap my mind around that, Robert. God takes everything. He takes everything that I have done to him. All of the disappointment that I have been to him. And he's willing to set that aside. He's willing to forgive me. Mm-hmm. He set that aside, not because of my own spiritual prowess. No, no. He set that aside because of everything that Jesus was willing to go through. He set it aside by the cross. And between this concept of forgiveness and God setting aside all of the guilt of my my past, you have this beautiful concept of canceling the record of debt. Um. I'm reminded of that word debt when Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 12, forgive us our Mm. debts. And then in that beautiful uh, store uh, parable of the unforgiving servant teaching us to forgive our brothers and sisters from the heart, you will find uh, Jesus using the word debt as a symbol of sin no less than four times. And then I turn to Luke chapter seven, and this woman with a very poor reputation comes, and uh, she uh, gives Jesus uh, special attention and uh, an- anoints his feet, and people are aghast. You mean he's going to let her touch him? If he only knew what kind of a person she was. And Jesus made this statement in Luke six forty seven. I tell you, her sins, which are many, he knew exactly who she was and what she had been. I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And he said all of that. He said it again in verse 49. And 
He said that after telling another story about two individuals that owed a debt. God sees sin as something we owe him and we can't pay it. But he sent Jesus to pay the debt. Therefore, the meaning of the word uh, ransom, uh, paying a debt uh, that we didn't owe. Uh, so G- with, of course, the blood of Jesus. I, I find it of interest in Colossians chapter 2, some translations don't use the word canceling the record. In fact, the New King James that I used for almost two decades actually says he wiped out. Mm. And the word literally means to smear over. And perhaps that comes from um, a concept, uh, a practice of Old Testament times that we find referenced in Psalm 32, verse 1 and verse 2. Blessed happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven. That's what we're talking about. Whose sin is covered. Covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Back in Bible times, when a person owed a debt, that debt would be engraved on a stone or a piece of pottery. And then when the debt was paid, wax would be melted over the engraving. And so there would be a smearing over of the engraving to signify the debt is owed no more. And I find that concept here in the word translated, canceling the record or wiped out, smeared over. In other words, everything that I owed God because of my bad decisions and sin, he sets it aside as though I owe it no more. And that because the debt has been paid by the blood of Jesus. And so I find a beautiful concept here taking place, but it takes place at a specific moment in time. And that moment in time is not when I believe. And it's not when I feel bad about my sins. And it's not uh, when I decide to do better and try to be a better person. In context of Colossians 3, verses 11 to 15, through these beautiful word pictures, the old person that used to be with all of his debt, sin, that is cut away. All of the sin and all of the guilt cut away. There's a a symbolic circumcision that takes place. The old man that was dead because of repentance, There's an immersion, a burial, and a coming up from this burial, a new person with new purpose walking in newness of life. There's this resurrection of a new person with the purpose of walking in newness of life. And as a result, uh, and that takes place because a debt that was owed is owed no more. There's this cancellation of the debt. There's this forgiveness of sins. And all of that is taking place when I am baptized. Yes, baptism is set before us in three symbolic fashions, three symbols, three word pictures. But it's still, it's not something that we just let take, you know, put in our mind as, oh yeah, that's that's all symbolism. It's symbolic, all right, but it's something that we are to do so that Something can be done to us. We, because we accept what God says, trust in what God says, and are willing to act on what God says about this command, baptism, when we are baptized as people who believe in Jesus, willing to change our life in repentance, this involves a spiritual circumcision, a spiritual resurrection, and a spiritual cancellation of all of the debt of sin from our past. And here we are, new people, fresh in the mind of God, with a special covenant relationship with God. And it all happens 
when we're baptized. That makes baptism very important, but it also makes baptism very special to us, doesn't it? Yes, sir. No doubt. I I was just thinking, it's no wonder that Peter, just summarizing uh, everything we've said, it's no wonder that Peter said in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that, that really summarizes there what, what it was that Paul says in Colossians 2. And of course, there are many, many passages throughout the New Testament that corroborate that same idea. But that passage, it seems, just sort of encapsulates all of this together. And what he wrote in 1 Peter 3.21, yeah. when he says, baptism does now save you. It's not the act of being put under water, right. but it's what being put under water results in. Mm. It results in a spiritual circumcision, a spiritual resurrection, a spiritual cancellation of the past, because at that moment in time, <clears throat> God is willing to set aside all of our past because of the blood of Jesus. And that's why we say when it comes to forgiveness, the blood of Jesus is the how Mm -hmm. that makes forgiveness possible. Mm -hmm. Baptism is the when that makes forgiveness a reality in our lives. Two beautiful thoughts that need to be put side by side. Wrap it up for us, Robert. Well, hey, listen, we want to hear from you. If you're listening to this, you have questions, comments, we, we would love to hear those. Our website, thelightnetwork.tv slash TWJ is where you can go to find. We, we take you there as a one-stop shop. You can find previous episodes, uh, the latest video, and a link to uh, the playlist of videos that we have there, subscription links as well. Down at the bottom, though, we have a little contact form that you can complete. That'll come to us, and uh, we would love to hear from you. Appreciate the feedback that we receive on a regular basis. Help us spread the word about Today with Jesus by telling your friends, coworkers, people that you uh, love, sharing this on social media, all wonderful ways to spread the word about our podcast. And you can subscribe in your favorite podcast app or on YouTube so that you never miss an episode. And uh, we have lots of previous episodes. I want to encourage you to visit our show notes For this one, this is Season 5, Episode 9, titled Blessed When Baptized, because what I'm going to do is put a link to several previous episodes that are somewhat related in terms of the topic to uh, uh, what we have discussed today, and we've uh, addressed this in a variety of ways. We've done it during our Q&A, What Does Jesus Say (laughs) series, as well as as we've uh, walked through the book of Mark. We saw similar themes. And so I want to put some links to that in our show notes for this episode, and I think that you will benefit and enjoy maybe that continuity of thought as well. Yeah, Brand new episodes every Tuesday, and uh, we'd love for you to be a part of our studies together each week. And if I could interject this, Mark, uh, uh, Mark, you said the book of Mark. (laughs) Hey, George. (laughs) Insert name here. It's fine. fine. (laughs) This is is Doug here, George. (laughs) I'm sorry, Robert, if I could interject this, uh, you were talking about how we appreciate getting uh, feedback from yeah. from all of our friends. And I want to say thank you to all that are listening to us that have been sending us feedback information, and especially for those of you that are sending us ideas for yes, new yeah. series and episodes and things that you would like for us to address. Boy, those have been very helpful and challenging. And and Robert and I are kind of mulling them over and contemplating what we might want to do come our uh, future series. But you are very helpful to us in that regard. And if there's a, a, a subject matter, a book of the Bible, Um, or a combination of those that you would like addressed, or if you have some questions that are challenging to you that you would like for us to try to turn to the Bible and see if we can uh, find some answers to, please let us know, and we will do our very best to look them over and uh, begin to address them in some form or fashion. Now, thank you again so much for doing that. 
Robert, enjoy the day. And thank you so much for helping us with these beautiful word pictures about baptism. Oh, I've enjoyed it. It's a wonderful thing. And next week, refuse to be abused by opinions. I love it. forward to that too as we study (laughs) through Colossians. Until then, live with Jesus in your heart and in your ways. God bless everybody. Bye.